State Farm and DJ Dramos from Life as a Gringo know that getting your money right brings freedom, empowerment, and future success. It's like we have to unlearn, as we do in every other part of our lives, but financially unlearn a lot of the BS that we were taught that holds us back from getting the sort of lifestyle that we want and being able to live the comfortable, financially free lifestyle that I'm sure all of us are striving for. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Ten years from today, Lisa Schneider will trade in her office job to become the leader of a pack of dogs. As the owner of her own dog rescue, that is. A second act made possible by the reskilling courses Lisa's taking now with AARP to help make sure her income lives as long as she does. And she can finally run with the big dogs. And the small dogs, who just think they're big dogs. That's why the younger you are, the more you need AARP. Learn more at aarp.org slash skills. It's time to get inside the Giants home. Let's go, let's go, let's go. On Giants.com. I like it, I like it, I and like it. And the Giants mobile app. Ooh, give me some juice. Part of the Giants podcast network. Let's roll. Welcome to another Giants Auto podcast brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. Had to be joined for the second straight year by Field Yates, who is now a draft analyst for ESPN. And Field, I wonder if you knew exactly what you were getting into when you went from host to analyst and all the extra work it's put on your plate trying to manage two young children at home, much like I am. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's certainly every day is 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 a challenge, but in the, in the best way possible, right? I mean, the draft is an event that I know you and I have loved since we were, you know, like the age of our children right now. So I certainly won't complain about covering the draft. I'd say the biggest difference between this role and sort of playing the point guard role in the past is it's, it's like, you know, people do care about p- players beyond, let's say, the first 50 or so, right? But as you know, like 97% of the coverage up until the draft is about that top 50 or so players. Heck, a lot of it's about the first, like, 12 or 15 picks, right? I mean, the quarterbacks mm-hmm. in this year's class, the wide receivers, Brock Bowers, et cetera. Um, but I got to really, you know, my, my biggest thing this year is recognizing that there are 257 picks, and we want to give some time to all 257 of them or at least the ones that, you know, of course, on uh, day three, a lot of commercial breaks, as you can imagine, during a seven-hour broadcast. So <laughs> when a guy's name is called during our broadcast, we want to make sure that we are doing our best to provide insight on that pick, whether it's fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh round pick, whether it's a small school guy, whether it's a big school guy, because uh, there are plenty of draft success stories that prove that it is certainly worth paying attention to day three of the NFL draft. And by the way, go check out Field on First Draft with Mel Kuyper. It's twice a week. It's a podcast. It's on the YouTube channel. I love your shows, and you guys dig into the to the day two and three guys. And I know Mel likes doing that, too. You guys do a great job. But let's start at the top field real quick. You're plugged into the league. Do you have any feel yet what the Patriots are going to do with three? We might not know yeah. what quarterback Washington is taking it to, but we know they're taking a quarterback. Do you have an idea if the Patriots are trying to get out yet or or, or what they're thinking at that spot? Yeah, I feel good about the first two picks. I, you know, Caleb Williams, you know, he can look at houses on Zillow right now if he wanted to in Chicago. <laughs> That's how secure that pick is. And then uh, Jaden Daniels, I think, is going to end up being a Washington commander by the time we get to April 25th, which is two weeks away from when you and I are having this conversation right now. And then I think the Patriots, you know, and, and I'm following the lead of some of the public comments that have been made uh, this year with Bill Belichick no longer the head coach. I would say that, uh, you know, you're hearing a little bit more uh, from the organization, for better or worse. I'm not exactly sure uh, where we land on that as of yet. But, you know, Gerard Mayo, the new head coach, just talks about the importance of of a quarterback, even Elliot Wolf, who's now kind of pulling the trigger for them. And the personnel department talked about the quarterback position during the combine, not quite as transparently, but did acknowledge it. And then Robert Kraft, the owner of the team, who, despite the fact that he is not the person who is making the draft picks, if he says he wants a quarterback at pick three, uh, the GM or the de facto GM and the head coach say, OK, we're going to find <laughs> the best one for you. So, so uh, I think the Patriots end up taking a quarterback at number three overall. And I'll use uh, some of the teams that are not picking in the first three as examples as to why the opportunity cost is really, really difficult to bypass if you are a team like the Patriots this year. Is that if you're the Patriots and you don't take a quarterback at three, first of all, we know this class, right? We're two weeks away from the draft beginning. We know what this class looks like. And at least in my evaluation, there are at least three quarterbacks that are worthy of a top three overall pick. I, agree. I think Drake may. Uh, part of that conversation as well. So while you could have a player next year in the draft, you could have 10 quarterbacks who are superior to Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels and Drake May and J.J. McCarthy. You could also have zero, right? I mean, we've seen this year to year, right? A couple of seasons ago, 
couple of years ago, the Steelers take Kenny Pickett round one. He's traded within two years. By the way, he was the only quarterback taken in the first two rounds, uh, much less like, you know, the first five picks. He won in the 20s for Pittsburgh. So there's a certainty, right? Beyond that, if you take a core, don't take a quarterback and instead trade down, you're going to fill a lot of your other needs, most likely wide receiver, offensive tackle for the Patriots, primary needs as well. But a year from now, you could be the eighth pick and you could be saying, all right, well, what would it have cost Atlanta, who if they didn't land Kirk Cousins, you better believe they were going to be in the quarterback market in the draft. It might cost them, I'm just making this up, eight plus their 2025 first plus their 2026 first or something like that. So the Patriots could be making the same move in reverse a year from now. So whether it was the Patriots, whether it was the Commanders, if it was any team at three that needed a quarterback, I would have vouched for taking a quarter. I will vouch for taking a quarterback at three and keeping it simple. And it's a little bit of a different situation. But I think the Giants in their war room is pro are probably having a similar conversation, right? Yeah. So if you get closer to 500, you're picking 14th. And let's say you decide, all right, we do want to make a quarterback switch. Well, a, is there a guy out there you want? B, the price yeah. to move up is really high. But even this year, Field, it's opportunity cost to your point, right? You have an opportunity to get a great player at a premium position, whether it's wide receiver or offensive tackle, if you want to go that way in this draft. You're going to have yeah. a chance at one of those two spots, and you're pretty damn sure the player is going to be good. Yeah. You can pick a quarterback at six, but honestly, with Arizona and the Chargers there, they're looking to get out. I think both of us agree on that. So you're going to have that fourth quarterback picked in that area ahead of the Giants. So not only you you have to spend the capital on a quarterback, you have to move up and you probably send next year's one to get into one of those spots to draft a quarterback. So how would you weigh that opportunity yeah. cost if you're the Giants, who do have a young quarterback place in Daniel Jones, who yeah. you know you believed enough in to sign to a long-term contract two years ago. Last year didn't go well. You know, there's a lot of different reasons for that. We don't need to get into those. How would you weigh that opportunity cost and decision that the Giants are making at six? compared to what you just talked about with New England? I think the hardest part of the equation that I have not yet been able to figure out is what's the cost? You mentioned the possibility of next year's one. I think I'm like, I, I have speculated the same, but I don't know that for sure, right? I mean, the move up, the, we keep using data points when we are trying to evaluate what it might cost to move up from one spot to the next. And because fairly recently, 2021, we had the 49ers go from 12 to three, we are all using the idea of about three first round picks, including this year's pick to move up, right? So if you're Arizona, you might get 11, 23, and a next year one from yep. Minnesota as an example. Don't, I mean, I can't guarantee that's what it's, what it's going to cost, but if I'm Arizona, I'm saying, did you see what happened three years ago? Like, that's exactly what we are thinking. Meanwhile, when was the last time we had like a six to four move up for a quarterback? We I think it was the Jets. Two. It wasn't like three twos, yeah. I think. Six to three when they moved yeah. up in 2018 to grab Sam Darnold. But, you know, to me, like the difference there was that the Jets, that was so early. That was actually, I believe, on St. Patrick's Day. Yep. So it was March, uh, way before the draft. And it was like the Jets were saying at that time, we're comfortable with whoever falls to three, right? Uh, there was not nearly as much certainty about which quarterback was going to be taken number one overall. A lot of people thought it could have been Sam Darnold. Some thought it could have been Josh Allen. Some, I think draft Twitter was advocating probably correctly for Lamar Jackson, uh, you know, Josh or Lamar, obviously the, the, the two crown jewels of that class. Um, but, you know, uh, it's, it's a different marketplace now. It feels like now that we've had a steeper cost paid by somebody else, the Cardinals and the Vikings, excuse me, the Chargers have that leverage of we're not just going to give it away to you. Right. So uh, and the other part of this is that. Arizona and the Chargers have very appealing options at four and five if they stay there, mm -hmm. right? So for Arizona, it's not just, all right, hey, you guys are offering us a deal less than what Miami got a few years ago. It's also that we're bypassing Marvin Harrison Jr., right? So anyways, to go to the Giants, I don't have a great feel of what it would cost to go from six to four to six to five. I think this is one where I'm going to take, uh, take the easy way out here and just say that I don't know how the team actually feels. I've heard the com the comments publicly and, and Coach Dayball and Joe Shane have both said many times over, if Daniel's healthy, he's the guy. And if I take them at their word, then I got to be honest with you, I'm actually really comfortable with Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr. Probably not him. Uh, at six, I, I feel great about one of those picks and those values, um, but I don't have a great feel about how rubber stamped that feeling is that Daniel Jones is the quarterback when healthy 
with no ifs. And the if in this case would be the opportunity to trade up to number four. So um, I, I, I know this is like not the job of a draft analyst in most cases, but I feel as though either path the Giants take is justifiable. If I you agree. trade up, I understand the methodology behind that. It's the idea that your ceiling has raised and you can tap into the depth of the wide receiver class later or the offensive tackle class later. If you stand pat, you're saying to yourself, I get it. Last year did not go how we wanted it to. But if I can do my math correctly, 15 months ago, maybe 16, whatever, January of 2023, Daniel Jones outdueled Kirk Cousins, who just signed a massive contract for nearly 350 yards in a playoff win. And when he signed that extension, you know, certainly some rhetoric was, you know, I still want to learn more about, you know, whether Daniel Jones is more of the first four years or the past year version of Daniel Jones. But there were a lot of people that said he earned that. He bowled out this past year. The Giants now have the most important part of the roster secured for four seasons. All right, Phil, two more. One quick on the trade detail, and then two, I'll just let you give some of your favorite day two and day three players. Sure. And I think the interesting part of this, too, is a lot of people think, well, it's an advantage for the Giants to be at six because the other team doesn't have to move back as far to make yeah. that trade, right? It does. It is. But I think in other ways, maybe the Chargers want to stockpile picks. Maybe they well, okay, want yes, to get yeah. more picks, yeah. and you know they want to pick one of those tackles at 12, and they don't want to yeah. pick at six. So which one of these teams, and I'm thinking the Patriots is probably the answer here, you think would prefer to stay in that top six area? Which teams would prefer to move into that 11 to 13 area where the Vikings, the Broncos, and the Raiders are hanging out looking for quarterbacks? Yeah, that's actually a good point because I think the Chargers would be happy moving down further to add more picks, like more volume, more swings. I think Arizona's a team that's got to be really, really mindful of how far they move down, right? Because they're glaring need at wide receivers. So obvious. And Marvin Harrison Jr., if you told me blindly, you know, six months ago, hey, Marvin Harrison Jr. would go fourth overall in the draft. How do you feel about that pick? Regardless of who it was picking Marvin Harrison Jr. and regardless of who went ahead of him, I'd say unbelievable value, right? Unless Marvin Harrison Jr. had decided to retire from football, that's a justifiable fourth overall pick. If you move down from four to 11, I believe that while the wide receiver depth is terrific, Mel and I talked about this a plenty on first draft. In whatever order you want to choose, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, those guys are different. We're talking about day one, instant impact, wide receiver one candidates, guys who immediately lift the ceiling and the floor of your offense. And I'd be careful because if, if you move to 11 and you know the draft is beautiful because there's mystery and intrigue, I don't think you're getting one of those no. guys. So uh, if you move down from four to 11, yeah, you got a bunch of extra swings, but your wide receiver room has a different complexion than it would have if you just sit there or move from four to six, because you're guaranteed to get one of those three if you go from four to six. I agree. All right, Fields, we got about 90 seconds left here. Give me your favorite day two and day three players where it's just you watch them and you're like, damn, I love this way. This guy, I love the way this guy plays football. Yeah, I'll give you a few guys here that come to mind. So day two, probably uh, early second round, maybe mid second round, somewhere in the, gosh, I tell you what, I got to be better about this. This is a draft analyst as well. I'm so wired for my days in scouting to remind people that every team sport is a little bit different and it just takes one team to allow a player to go higher than you might expect, right? Uh, but Jalen Polk, wide receiver from Washington, one of my favorite amidst a very deep wide receiver class, but so tough is excellent in contested catch situations. And I think we always, uh, we, we, we evaluate, I think probably a little bit too much players making or having great hands for like the spectacular <clears throat> sports center top 10 plays. Uh, that certainly matters, right? Uh, those live on in infamy, but I, I like guys who just, uh, he just, they just make consistent catches Inside, outside of their frame, I think Jalen Polk, I compare him to a low post player in the NBA from 20 years ago. Not a lot of flash, not a like lot of it. substance, but he gets buckets. Uh, number one, another one, Marshawn Neeland, Western Michigan edge. Uh, the sack production is not going to blow you away, but you go back and watch Western Michigan, especially this year when Braden Fisk was not there. He transferred to Florida State, had a great year with the Seminoles. Uh, the way they had to utilize Marshawn Nealand uh, was he was the best player by far, right? This guy, but he's so strong. You don't see as many guys come in with as much raw power as Marshawn Nealand has. He also had a terrific three cone uh, and short shuttle during the combine. Big physical edge rusher who I think could go somewhere in the mid-second. 
Uh, day three picks, Miles Harden, safety corner, probably I think a corner uh, from South Dakota. Frisky, the ball just finds him, or I guess he finds the ball as a defensive player. He is a turnover forced waiting to happen, has tremendous confidence. We're at a 4 5 at the combine as well. So a good enough time to feel pretty strongly about that one, and then I'm trying to think of one more day three. I like Luke McCaffrey, wide receiver from Rice, who, of course, if you're saying to yourself, is he related to Christian? Yeah, he is. He's his kid brother, one of his kid brothers, and he is an awesome player. He used to be a quarterback in Nebraska, transfers to Rice, ends up moving to wide receivers, played there for two years, has an awesome year this past year, double-digit receiving touchdowns, had 24 contested catches this past season. That number, just some st- some sort of context on it, that was tied with Roma Dunze for the most in all of FBS. So anytime you're tied with Roma Dunze for pretty much any good category, you have my attention. So uh, I wish that we gave more time to these young players. Not every player comes in and lights the NFL on fire and they're just dominant from day one, like Odell Beckham Jr. when he was a rookie. Um, some of these guys need time. And Luke McCaffrey might be a redshirt type player, but I'm betting on the development of a player who's come so far in such a short period of time. And believe it or not, when you're McCaffrey, it turns out you're wired pretty competitively. So I do think this kid has a chance to become a better player over the next two to three seasons. And his dad was a pretty good wide receiver too, which also- Hey, hey and, and, and they, everybody says his mom was the best athlete in the family, Lisa. So uh, I would say that uh, as far as the gene pool is considered, uh, he won the lottery and more. Phil, keep up the great work. We appreciate the time, my friend. Thank you, John. Enjoyed it. And I'll talk to you again, hopefully sometime soon. You love turf. You're good at it. So you start a turf biz. Business grows. Your savings grow. Become the most celebrated name in turf. Are you ready for all that life brings? John Tittle Podcast is brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants from game day to every day. Citizens is made ready for Giant fans with insights, guidance, and solutions. Learn more at citizensbank.com. We go from Field Yates the NFL Network, and Bucky Brooks. Bucky Brooks, of course, can be found on Path to the Draft on NFL Network. And all of their coverage of the draft from April 25th to April 27th on the NFL Network. And now we go from Field Yates from ESPN to Bucky Brooks over at NFL Network. You can, of course, find Bucky Brooks on their Path to the Draft show every weekday on NFL Network. They'll also, of course, be co- part of NFL Network's coverage of the draft from April 25th to the 27th in Detroit. Bucky, John Schmoke here in East Rutherford, man. Hope uh, draft season treating you well, man. How you doing? I'm good, man. I'm getting excited. You know, you talk about two weeks away from the draft, and so that's always an exciting time to kind of finally see where all these top prospects go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we just got done talking to Field the Eights a lot about the Giants at the top and being a quarter and uh, potential of taking a quarterback. I have to give you a chance to get your North Carolina love in here, though, and I want to talk about Drake May for a second. You talk about grading the flashes a lot, and I, I like that terminology. I think with Drake May, you do that. You could see why he might have the highest upside of any quarterback in the class. But for me personally, he's my number two guy, by the way. I think he's great. I got in trouble with that with Sam Darnold when I graded his flashes. I loved him a lot, and then that hasn't worked out so well. So talk about the balance you take in trying to grade flashes versus the overall body of work when it comes to Drake May. Yeah, well, look, you're always trying to grade the flashes because once they show you that they can do it once, they can do it again. But it's important to understand the environment that you're trying to create to allow them to really uh, relive those flashes. And so for Drake May, I think it's important that everyone understands uh, in the last four years, he's only played two seasons. He didn't play his final season in high school because of COVID. Uh, he sat behind Sam Howell his freshman year at North Carolina, and then he played the last two years. So what you're getting is a very talented player, but a very inexperienced player. And the coaching staff must have a plan to help him kind of find his way through the National Football League as he's learning how to play the game uh, because he's an inexperienced player. Uh, but if you're able to tap into that, build an offense around what he does really well, which, look, man, he's super athletic. He has big-time arm talent. He's an A1 kid when it comes to all the intangibles. But it's about putting him in a system where he doesn't have to carry the offense early. Maybe he can manage it early, and then later in his career he can be able to carry it. We talked about trading up with field. How about the concept of trading down for the Giants here at six, Bucky? Do you think, A, if there's no quarterback on the board, there would be an opportunity to trade down? And if you want one of those top three wide receivers in that little cluster with Harrison, Neighbors, or Dunze, can you afford to move down to maybe even, let's say, the Bears decide we have one guy we really like. They want to move from, like, nine to five. If you're the Giants, would you consider something like that? Or is that just too risky in case – Someone could even jump you 
to eight if the Falcons think they can trade down, still draft a good defensive player if you're the Giants and you want to get one of those top three wideouts? No, if my heart is set on one of those top three wideouts, then I'm a stick and pick. Uh, I don't want to get cute trying to get another pick or anything like that when my player is there for me to take. And given the way that, like, all these things are being mocked out, I mean, you're going to have your pick of the top two of the top three receivers. If Marvin Harrison Jr. goes like we think he'll go, well, then you're going to be sitting there with Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze. Neighbors has the juice. He has the speed, the quickness, the explosiveness. Uh, the last time we saw a big LSU standout play in New York, Odell Beckham Jr., it looked pretty good. Uh, Roma Dunze is the big body playmaker that is more in the mold of a Jamar Chase, physical playmaker. So for, for me, I don't want to mess around. I want to have my pick as opposed to let the board dictate who I'm going to take. And if I'm the Giants, Joe Shane and Brian Dayball, I'm going to stick and pick. I'm not going to mess around. As a scout, take me inside the war room, and the Giants are sitting there. Obviously, this decision will be made long before draft night, and they're deciding between a Dunze and neighbors. How would you parse those two? Does it get down to fit and your system if they're graded so closely? Tell, tell me what that debate sounds like between the scouts, coaches, and decision makers in that war room when you're trying to figure out how you're stacking neighbors in a Dunze, given how close they are on most people's boards. You know, it depends on how the juice uh, like who has the power when it comes to making the final pick. But what has happened through this point, like the scouts have already presented their cases on both of the players. And so if the players are similarly graded, it now comes down to the coaches and really it comes down to the head coach or whoever's in charge of the offense. What do we envision? Uh, what do we need at the position? What do we need as a number one? Which one do we believe is better capable of handling the responsibilities that a number one receiver has to handle in our offense not in any offense but in our offense and so that's what it comes down to and then it's also okay let's look at the quarterback and if we're saying that we're going to continue on with Daniel Jones how can we make his game better does he need someone who's a catch and run specialist like a um, Malik Neighbors or can we get away with someone who's more of a jump ball playmaker like a Roma Dunze a lot of it has to do with the personnel that you have but also the scheme that you want to run what do you think in the modern-day NFL, Bucky, is more valuable, that run-after-catch guy or that true dynamic X like you just described for Adunze? Um, I would say run-after-catch is really important. And the reason run-after-catch is important is because it allows you to employ a high-completion percentage offense, one that is easy for the quarterback, but it yields big gains. If you're one of those that push it down the field and you don't have wide receivers that can break tackle or make things happen in space, makes it really, really difficult to go the length of the field. And we know there's a direct correlation between big plays, explosive plays, and scoring points. And the only way that you can score points in the National Football League, you have to find a way to make plays that are 20 yards or longer. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that 100%. Fi final one on, on the kind of quarterback wide receiver dynamic here. You mentioned Daniel Jones, and I've asked, we've had a bunch of guests the last couple of weeks. How would you think about the Giants' decision as to whether or not you want to draft a quarterback to either compete with uh, or play alongside or eventually replace Daniel Jones, a guy they believed in enough to sign that big deal to two years ago. Last year didn't go well, small sample size, a lot of injuries, nothing went right around him. The way I've thought about it is that, look, if you think a guy has a chance to be like a top seven, top eight superhero type of quarterback, pull the trigger, but don't just pick one for the sake of replacing Daniel. How would you think about that decision at six, which is really could be something that defines the direction of the franchise over the next few years? This is going to require a lot of discipline from the Giants front office when it comes to picking. Because what happens is subconsciously when you know you need something, you tend to kind of influence the grading to make sure that the position of need is at the top where you have one of the picks. But if we're really gating the player based on who are the best players in this draft, well, then those quarterbacks might not be there. Because not only are you talking about the big three wide receivers, but then you can talk about the offensive linemen that are available to kind of make some things. Uh, you can never go wrong taking the best player because if you take a lot of the BPAs, you end up having a roster loaded with really good players. And then that gives you an opportunity to do some special stuff. I would expect Joe Shane being a throwback scout. I think he'll resist the temptation of just going at the next quarterback, and he'll make sure that the player that the Giants take at six is the best player available on the board. I'm curious how you think the teams from 11 to 13, the Vikings, the Broncos – and the Raiders are going to handle this Bucky in terms of trying to find their next quarterback. Because I think aside from the, the, the top three teams, they're the three teams that are really most desperate. And I'll, I'll use that word 
to find the quarterback. Uh, how aggressive are all three? I think we all know Minnesota has kind of, you know, shown that they're going to try to go up and get one. But how do you think the Broncos and the Patriots, I mean, the Raiders are going to handle this, especially since the Broncos don't have that second round pick? Yeah, that'd be interesting. And it'll be another test and discipline for all those guys when it comes to grading players for your team versus stretching and reaching for need picks. Uh, at some point, these these quarterbacks will be at a round value or they'll be at a pick value where you can confidently pull the trigger and feel like, okay, I'm getting comparable value for what it is. Right now, they feel like stretches and reaches. Uh, um, but Look, you can stretch and reach for a little bit because if a player comes in your system and he fits, he's going to play really well. And nobody will remember that you over uh, so that you picked him out of turn when it came to the draft. Uh, you just got to have conviction and you got to be able to back that conviction up with like factual uh, evidence that suggests, OK, you know, we're making a good decision. It's a little out of our league, but we're going to go with it because he's going to make it right. If you feel good about the character of the player, you can gamble a little bit on some of those things. Giant fans love a winner. It's why they love Citizens. They named a 2022 Best Bank in the U.S. by The Banker as the official bank of the Giants and sponsor of the huddle. Citizens is made ready for fans of Big Blue. Learn more at citizensbank.com. All right, Bucky, I want to jump to the second round here. The Giants have a lot of needs, right? And they have to fill a lot of them. Let's assume they go wide receiver in round one. So we'll take that out of the mix. And we know tackles will go a lot in round one. But then you get to round two. That might be flushed out a little bit. Where do you think the most depth is in this draft when you get to that second and third round on day two, other than wide receiver, where there's going to be a decent volume of players at these positions that the Giants could attack? I would say like the deepest part when we get to it in those second and third rounds, it's going to be the defensive back. Defensive back class is loaded with guys that should come off the board in the second and third round. Uh, whether it's your Mac Milton coming from Rutgers, um, uh, Mikey sanders coming from Michigan. I mean, Renaro Green uh, being a guy from Florida State that's really, really under the radar. There are a lot of guys out there that can play. They got some nastiness to them, some snapback to them when it comes to tackling that can get a jump. Uh, the defensive back class is one where I think you can get tremendous value in the second and third round. Yeah, I'm with you, Bucky. And you, those three guys you mentioned are actually the three guys that I have second round picks, uh, second round grades on, along with Rackestraw out of Missouri. What do you think of the three bigger corners that I have? I have them a little bit later. Some people have them around too. The TJ Tampas, the Cam Hart's, mm -hmm. the Kyrie Jacksons, that group of kind of bigger perimeter corners, which you're getting fewer and fewer of now coming out of college football. Yeah, you're getting fewer and fewer of them because most times those guys make their way to the, the wide receiver line. So they never get a chance to really play DB. Uh, I'll say this about uh, Jackson McKeer from Oregon. Look, he's a headhunter. He's a sticker. He does a great job sticking his nose in there. Uh, he is not afraid of the smoke, and he goes and embraces it. Uh, that's going to serve him well when you get to the next level because sometimes you may not be the most talented player, but if you can get the game played on your terms, you can find a way to have success. He appears to kind of know who he is and what he is, and he plays with a confidence because he knows what he can do and what he can't do. Uh, that helps. Um, when you think about like TJ Tampa, another big player coming out of Iowa State, instincts, awareness, but doesn't necessarily have the the movement and, and, and the speed that you like. And part of that is because we haven't really been able to assess it fully, like in terms of getting it all together. But he's a big corner. Anytime you have corners that are over six foot that can run a little bit, it gives them a chance because now you can match up with those opposing big guys. And then Kyrie Jackson, to me, is just like a fantastic player. You know, he's just – Really good player, dynamic, explosive, physical, gets after it, loves the smoke and the energy and all that other stuff. It's just a matter of are you comfortable enough with bringing him in the locker room, making sure that the environment is the right fit for him. Um, because if the, if the environment is right, the culture is right, he's going to win. He's going to win at a high level. Giant fans love a winner. It's why they love Citizens, named a 2022 Best Bank in the U.S. by The Banker. As the official bank of the Giants and sponsor of the huddle, Citizens is made ready for fans of Big Blue. Learn more at citizensbank.com. You're ready for a change. Payday comes early with Citizens, so go to that retreat. New you moves to the country. Now you're raising goats and launching a lifestyle brand. Are you ready for all that life brings? And then I think there are a couple other slot guys I think are just staying. The guys that can't play slot, maybe they can go outside too. I think Andrew Phillips out of Kentucky is a good player. DJ James out of Auburn, a little bit light, but I think he moves mm. extremely well. Buck, Josh Newton out of TCU. What do you think of that kind of next group after that, you know, that that first group you mentioned in terms of Green Sands or Stone Melton, the DJ James, the Josh Newtons, the Andrew Phillips? Yeah, no, I mean, I think there's value for all those guys. And I think we're talking about, you're talking about 
more so top of the fourth round, bottom of the third round, where those guys can come in. The big thing when it comes to playing in the slot, in, in a way, the slot defender needs to be your best defender because he gets all the smoke coming out. Right? And so you have to be very nimble, very athletic to be able to handle all that while also having a high football IQ because you're asked to play linebacker. Even though you're in a DB body, you have to play linebacker. So how you fit inside and outside of the scheme all matters. So you got to be, you know, you got to get throw an experienced player in the slot to be able to get it done, even though I do like the guys that you alluded to. When would you start thinking about picking a safety in this draft? And the Giants, it looks like with their new defensive coordinator, Shane Bowen, they're going more to your traditional split safety t- type of thing mm-hmm. where you need guys to be pretty versatile to be able to move up or down. Uh, your thoughts when that first safety should go based on the value of the players in the position and then which guys you might like in that type of defense. Uh, first safety should go. Tyler Newbin should go. Mm, I would say like mid second round. That's when they kind of go. I think people are still trying to understand what exactly is the safety and how do we quantify what he adds. But I would tell you that the safety prevents the D ball from going over the top of the defense, keeps everything in front. Like just, you know, just uh, they're able to do it. So to to me, it's about like, as we just go back and and we reflect on the class, it's about making sure we go back to the main point. Hey man, you can't go wrong taking really, really good players. Let's focus on the players that fit into what we do. Let's not worry about the fanfare on the outside. Let's make sure that we've done the necessary work to look at them and say, okay, they fit. They fit our culture. They fit how we want to play. They fit how we want to play in two, three years. If you get enough of those gut players on the squad, the re- the results and all this stuff kind of naturally happen and take care of themselves. Giants have Dexter Lawrence, the defensive tackle book, Brooke, the, uh, Bucky. They have, um, they just signed Jordan Phillips, another big nose tackle type of guy. What three techniques do you like on day two? I know you have Braden Fisk, Aurora Rowe, uh, Chris Jenkins, mm-hmm. Mackay Wingle. There's a lot of guys, Michael Hall. Which one of those guys do you think you can get really good value at um, in, in day um, two as a guy that you want to be able to get upfield and attack gaps? Uh, look, man, I'm, I, you can't go wrong like invest in the family business. So let's go with Chris Jenkins, Jr., because his dad was an all-pro player, two-time all-pro player, um, played – uh, for us when I was in Carolina in the front office and just his dad is just an absolute animal. And I'm just thinking it's coming. If any of that, whew, it's going to be uh, like problematic. And so when I see Chris and, and, and his ability to kind of collapse the, pack, the pocket, to be able to get after, to be an up high energy tempo player, uh, he didn't get all the, that all the way from dad, but he certainly has the, the bloodlines to get it. And also when you got an uncle, Cullen, Cullen Jenkins, who also had a nice career in the league, you're coming fully equipped to training camp knowing how to play and how to get things done right away. Yeah, Colin, former Giant at the end of his career as well. Good dude, and uh, absolutely, really good bullet lines there. How late, Bucky, do you think you can wait if you want to try to get a running back that can split some time with Devin Singletary and Eric Gray and be a part of that room? Can you wait till round four? Can you stretch to round five? When would you try to attack that position if you're the Giants, given the other needs you have on the roster? Now, what position are we talking about again? Running back. Want to, oh, running back. So now when we go to running back, like you know, there will be plenty of running backs that are available on day three, and they're going to be good running backs that are available. Uh, if I'm not in a hurry to get it done, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait to the, the fifth round to be able to kind of like get into it and find my player. The guys that are of interest that could be available, Frank Gore Jr. could be there. Not necessarily the fleetest of foot, but, man, just a natural runner, jitterbug, can scoot through and make plays happen. Uh, Bucky Irving is another one that can kind of do it like make make plays on a perimeter, but also can kind of run downhill a little bit. I'll give you a big surprise because I know Giants love, I mean, they absolutely love Wisconsin guys going all the way back to Ron Dane. How about Braylon Allen, a uh, big running back from Wisconsin, physical, for whatever reason, didn't get a lot of opportunities his last year, but this dude can play. And I think if you look at the way the Bills have played, snug. They want, to, they want to play a physical brand. He's used to that. He played at Wisconsin. He knows how to get down. All right. Two more position questions, Buck, before I get your prediction at six. Tight end, I think, is interesting. I only have, I think, three players in Brock Bowers round one, two players with 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 day two grades. Who are maybe some of your day three tight ends that that kind of jump out to you specifically that you really like that could that could provide some value? Uh, let's see. Theo Johnson from Penn State is a guy that could find his way down there. Super athletic free, tore it up at the combine. Uh, body beautiful kid, meaning when you hear me say body beautiful, guy that 
man, if he's the first one off the bus, you feel like, oh boy, we in bad, we got a bad hand. So um, I would say Theo Johnson is one. Dallin Holker from Colorado State is another one. Really showed up and performed well at the East West Shrine game. Uh, those are two guys that I'll keep a close eye on. All right, and then how about interior offensive line? The Giants want to continue to shore up their guard spot. A any day two or three guys that, that really jump out at you that, that you like that could contribute, you think, at guard and maybe eventually develop into a starter? Yeah, no, there, there's some guys, and I, I love you guys up in the Northeast. We'll stay right on the Northeast, and we'll go to UConn, and we'll go get Chris Haynes, who is not only a high motor player, plays the game the right way, is built to play the game the right way. Um, just – being able to kind of have that mauler brawler mentality at the point of attack is important. It's important for a run heavy team. Um, so I, I, I would think Haynes has an opportunity to go and be a guy. And then everybody else is kind of like a hodgepodge of, of like, oh, I play multiple sports. I do all this or whatever. So, but um, there's some other good guys that are available. There's some other ones that are make it. Cooper BB will be one of those that falls in line. But, uh, you got to investigate and, and really be open about how you want to play them so everyone knows what they're getting into. And then finally, when all is said and done, well, obviously it depends what happens one through five. What do you think eventually the Giants do when they pull the trigger at number six? I think as much as they try and get up, um, I think they end up falling short. I think they end up getting a consolation prize, not the quarterback, but one of the top playmakers and the playmaker they get from the week. Which is, by the way, not a bad consolation prize, by the way. I, I think you will be very <laughs> happy if that ends up happening. But good stuff. Anything you want to put out there, promote? Anything that you're up to besides the stuff I mentioned with the network? No, man, it's all good. I really appreciate you having me on. It's always fun at this time of year. Uh, I look forward to seeing what the, the Giants pull off uh, with the number six overall pick. You guys must be right in the middle of your high school spring practices, I would imagine, right at this point. You rolling? Uh, we're rolling a little bit. We just, we're just beginning to kind of kick it off and run around and do stuff. But it's fun. A lot of fun. Bucky Brooks, NFL Network. Thanks for joining us on the Giants Little Podcast, everybody. We'll see you next time. Zen Nicotine Pouches deliver nicotine satisfaction anywhere, anytime, which means Zen pairs well with you, your personality, your schedule, and your spontaneity. Zen fits easily into your bag, pocket, and into your life because it's smoke-free, hands-free, and hassle-free. So the only person who will know you have a Zen pouch in is you. Visit Zinn.com or head to your local convenience store today to find your Zinn. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. PNC Bank knows banking should be boring. If it wasn't, bankers might sound like game show hosts. Mr. Smith, you're the next contestant. Are you ready to bet it all? Uh, I'm just here to open a line of credit. Oh, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. Exciting is good for game shows, not banks. That's why PNC Bank takes a boring approach to your money, so you can live a happily fulfilled life. PNC Bank, brilliantly boring since 1865. Credit is subject to approval. Certain restrictions and conditions apply. PNC Bank National Association, member FDIC. Brilliantly boring is a service mark of the PNC Financial Services Group, Inc.